Hello and welcome to Australia in Space TV. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the editor with My Security Media. This is an official lead up interview for the Indo Pacific Space and Earth Conference 26 to the 28th of November, being held in Perth alongside the Asia Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum. Today, we've got one of our panel speaker guests uh, from the US, Laura Ann Edwards, uh, the Innovation Catalyst Climate Space Oxford Space Initiative. Uh, Laura, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, you're in California and you're going to be speaking at IPSEC, the Space Technologies for Disaster Management, Building Resilient Communities, and you've also got a project called Data Oasis. I think maybe introduce us to uh, Data Oasis. Uh, you mentioned it's uh, more of a concept than uh, a company or, or that kind of approach. But yeah, Data Oasis, and we'll get into a bit about your background as well. Sure. The, the common thread in all of my efforts, whether it's the research through the, with Oxford and the Space Initiative, or whether it's thinking through things like climate tech and, and how to apply um, targeted space tech. It's all about systems change and systems solutions. And so Data Oasis is a particular approach to um, making more accessible the world's treasures in terms of data archives. Because everybody thinks that search engines like Google can find all the data, and they actually can't. What they can find are the addresses of data archives and of, and of websites and papers. But the data, um, the data that the algorithms of the world are eating up, are actually still very much siloed. Um, the data outside of, of, of publicly available ones. Any case, so Data Oasis is, uh, is uh, an approach to how we would federate or, or make um, things discoverable and accessible between databases and data archives. Is it a With bit like that? Like my purpose is to is to be able to uh, help multidisciplinary teams um, for interdisciplinary solutions for things like, as complicated as climate change. I think I get it. It's a bit like uh, well, I, my first thought is a data lake, but that sort of dumping mm -hmm. all the data in one spot, data oasis. Is it a little bit like a data classification or you go hunting down data sets? Uh, yeah, maybe just honestly, go honestly, the it's like, honestly, it's it, the intention um, was to, and it, and it didn't win the TED prize to be able to execute on it fully yet, but the intention is really like a Mac Daddy card catalog, you know, with oh. an AI uh, research librarian assist. And it's really to, it's not in any way to gather the data. It's just to tell you where it is, what format it's in, what the permission structures are. Because open data doesn't, at least in my terminology, doesn't necessarily mean free. It just means you can find it and, and, and you know, pursue the steps to get permission. Um, it's often so, the, the largest challenge, is it not? Uh, in yeah. terms of understanding even the, the format that it's sitting in as well, right? So you need to potentially... Mm -hmm. transfer it to a manageable format as well? No, see, I don't want to touch anybody's data because the really giant data sets like genomes and, and things are too big. They need, but I need to know where they are um, so that if I'm writing a research proposal or putting together a, a complicated team, I put that in my proposal that we need the budget to go either convert this, you know, do whatever needs to be done to clean it up, to use it in, in said new algorithm. And right now, um, there's a huge amount of data um, that is, I would say, the precious data of humanity, like what we would put in an arc if the asteroid really was coming. Um, and we, we don't have any, we don't know where it all is. It's under arcane names with um, special sector terminology. It's not easily discoverable in any in any way, shape, or form, and that's that's inexcusable. So we have to fix that. I suppose is there a relevance to the age of the data as well? You find that more you know more contemporary data, new data, they're getting better at understanding how it's going to be used into the future and and classifying it and storing it. Are so you generally yes finding and no. older data. <laughs> Well, yes and no. The, the, the short answer is, of course, data analytics and data tools have, have improved by leaps and bounds. But the, the, the ugly truth is the, um, so think about a medical, a, a, a medical trial. Only a tiny bit of that data is in some official archive. And good luck, you trying to find it. <laughs> so what about all the other data? So in terms of, you asked about historical data, um, it depends on what you're studying. Right, um, we you could only do 
there, there's all there's data is like anything else that it's what you need and when you need it is different. You might you can't replace a study over 40 years. You can't replace economic data over 100 years. Yeah. It, it is by definition required to be historical data to be useful. Right? Well, That's my right. first thought is that given the age of data, when you mentioned 40 years, the amount of bias that might be in there as well, uh, given you know sort of our, our development as over time. So that's that's my first thought. Is the older the data, probably the more bias that there might well be uh, in the collection of that. The other first thing is maybe back to point. It's a good segue to what we're talking about, particularly historical data and its relevance to climate change and our, mm -hmm. our climate today and, and what it's doing versus to what it's done in the past. Uh, space technologies, and, and we can talk about just data in general in relation to disaster management uh, and building resilient communities. A uh, couple of questions maybe and to, to kick yeah. you off and, and take whatever direction you want. But first one is the types of data that you are finding that are that is relevant to a re resilient community. Uh, do you take a sort of a sociology approach of all data is potentially relevant or do you tend to focus on certain data sets? So the, the, just to put things in two big groups um, in terms of earth observation data, there's, there's literally the, the using all the, all the tools uh, to look at earth um, at, you know, with ever greater density and regularity with, it feels like I, I, I was, I wrote down that I probably look at the business plans of four to six um, satellite data analytics uh, companies or th that's a part of their business where they have some sort of climate data analytics or um, or, or disaster uh, awareness. So they're, they're, the goal is to, you know, they're looking for things that are higher res, that are, are more timely, where the information can be distilled, that's actionable sooner. But what you what you need for some things, once a week might be fine, once a day might be fine. For a fire, not so much. For a, a, a disruption in the topsoil in a flood zone and the, and the potential danger, not not so much, right? So we're we're seeing um, uh, the, there's the weather data, and then there's the looking truly at Earth for changes, and the, uh, that's just getting more and more robust. The same, I mean, it's happening in every direction, right? We we barely mapped the moon and now we're starting to map the moon in, in super detail because we're serious about it. We've had satellites for a long time and but they had different agendas. They were security, they were air traffic control, they were a number of things and and every every few months they're now deeper and deeper and deeper into the in terms of the granularity of the data, the high resolution, the the speed with which it's it's brought to you. So there, there's a huge amount of data, and the question, if anything, it's 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 a it's a it's a um, a logjam of so much data coming down. How to make sense of it fast enough to to be able to do what needs to be done, particularly in emergencies. Do you find that's part of the challenge is getting the scope of work right as to what it is you're trying to either measure or uncover? over time, uh, given, you know, the topic of resilient communities, you know, it's where the population is, where it's potentially moving uh, versus what the environment is doing. And then also the man-made sort of changes that uh, we make within that environment over time as well. It's a very broad uh, sort of longitudinal, longitudinal uh, kind of approach. It's getting the scope of what is the question, what's the research problem or the problem you're trying to trying to solve. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I guess I have to pay homage to the the the, the folks in the academic and and um, multinational uh, entities like the UN and the World Bank and the World Health Organization and DFID, et cetera, who who've been doing a whole lot of work for for decades. So where space data is particularly or data from space um, is particularly powerful, in my opinion, is when it's combined with the learnings and the and the context that experience on the ground right so one of one of our researchers at the oxford space initiative one of the colleagues samira barzan does amazing work taking um you know all the data from those sorts of organizations and then and then being able to pair that 
with this with the cutting edge in satellite data and she can extract out of thing it's it's a it's a wonder if you ever have a chance to sit in one of her lectures do it because you're like oh my god you can tell from that the poverty levels the this the that it's shocking what they can pull out of a color coded heat map of uh, of a, of a city on the edge of the desert right um, let let them know all the sorts of things that um, we wouldn't have we didn't know how to do that we didn't know how to fully pair those um, with the, with this kind of accuracy uh, before so it's great for places that that you know some things and then the satellite data with especially with different tools infrared different different things um, let you read different metrics on the ground I think that's, that's a really good one it's either yeah, it's either going to verify or sort of take you in a new direction in terms of that on earth uh, approach that you have to disaster management and, and and sort of building the resilient communities over time as well. Do you find uh, what's your preferred or sort of most common data sets that you tend to deal with? You talked about sort of heat mapping and the di different sort of spectral analysis that we have available now. Do you find uh, sort of what, what in terms of emergency management and, and city planners and the like, is there any sort of go-to that you would recommend, uh, sort of any patterns or sort of low-hanging fruit that you tend to go, yep, have you thought about this or have you thought about that? Well, it's, it's actually remarkable how, how, how few sources there are for weather data. Um, and there's no doubt that everything stems from weather. So I, I would say those are the core data sets that, it, that the whole world uses um, and then builds around it and selects um, uh, pairing that with the hyper local location or region that they're concerned with, right? Everybody's looking for a different thing. If you're in 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 um, in aviation, you're looking at jet streams and travel. You know, you're looking at very different things in terms of wind shear disturbances. Very different than what um, somebody who's looking along a bulging riverbank. Or, or who's looking for, um, you know, there's all, there's all kinds of, like you say, resilient community building. So is that, is that about drought? Is that about floods? Is that about fire? It's all of the above, right? Dust storms. Well, I suppose to finish off, uh, it's a good segue. I was about to introduce the panel, but what type of work are you actually doing? Uh, who do you tend to, who are your clients, I suppose to say? Who are your client profiles uh, and, and sort of the current work that you do? Sure. So I'm, I'm, I, I spend a lot of my time with the Oxford Space Initiative, which is a research collective at the University of Oxford in the UK. And we, um, we focus on the social sciences aspect of the space era. So I, my specialty in, in, the, in my Oxford hat is design thinking, putting the hum, humans in the, in the decision matrix, right? Um, for what this era that we are living through, that we're all lucky enough to live through, that's both the climate change era and the, and the space starfaring era. So I spend a lot of time on education um, programming. Um, you know, we're, uh, we have an upcoming workshop on space geopolitics, that sort of yeah. thing. She, she, yeah, you know. So I, 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 that's, that's the, uh, uh, I, I, get to, I get to play academic um, hat. Um, and then the rest of my time is mostly spent as a consultant uh, helping folks in dual use technology strategies. So whether that's defense and commercial or climate and another sector, so climate and space. Um, and so that, that's where those things come in. I'm particularly personally interested in how space tech, not just satellite data, uh, can be deployed faster, sooner in this critical 30 year window of climate adaptation and remediation. So I spend a lot of time um, with those sorts of clients. So they range from tech tech startups to pretty well-established folks to governments. Well, it sounds like it, you're one of those people who just can't keep still. So therefore you have yeah. to do a very broad body of work. Yeah. Um, you're gonna be, we're about to release the, uh, the full program, uh, at least the preliminary program, but I've got your panel in front of me. It's the Space Technologies for Disaster Management, Building Resilient Communities. You're going to be on with Vincent Kessler, General Manager with Synspective. Uh, he's from Singapore. We've got you from the US, but also it sounds like you're wearing wearing a UK sort of cap uh, as well. We've got Ekaterina uh, Kostiakina. Uh, she's a medical consultant and air ambulance flight team with Health New Zealand. 
and Hiro Kazu Mori. Uh, he's the CSO with Warp Space from Japan. So we've got a very, you mentioned geopolitics there. We've got mm -hmm. a nice uh, sort of geopolitical uh, approach coming into that particular panel uh, for IPSEC. That's the Indo-Pacific Space and Earth Conference being held in Perth on the 26th to the 28th of November with a joint exhibition with the Asia Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum. Laura Ann Edwards coming in from the uh, US. Appreciate it's your Sunday afternoon. It's my Monday morning. <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. So thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV. Indeed. And I look forward to seeing you uh, uh, in Perth. 